All right, well, let's get going. Um, welcome to our webinar on designing a wood beam according to in the NDS 2018 National Design Standards. Um, we will be discussing about different wood products and the full design process for designing a wood beam. My name is Brooke Smith, and this is. All right, so first a bit of an outline. Uh, we'll be beginning a bit of an introduction, um, then talking about different wood products that are available on the market, talking about some adjustment factors that get applied during the design process, and then we'll go through the full design process, flexural, shear, bearing, and deflection, all of your relevant limit states. Then go through a couple of example beam calculations before concluding and taking further questions. So about us, um, as I said, my name is Brooke Smith. I'm currently the lead engineering developer for ClearCalx. I'm a chartered professional engineer in Australia and a licensed professional engineer in the United States. Um, I have a master's degree and I'm a part of multiple different professional societies. I have previous experience in um, research and development consulting and specializing in cold form steel in a research fellowship in thin-walled steel, uh, system behavior of thin-walled steel, as well as forensic work for reinforced and post-tension concrete. Um, and colleague here, Laurent, is the structural lead in North America for ClearCalx. Um, he's responsible uh, for all of our United States and Canadian design calculators and has previous experience in structural diagnostics uh, and restoration engineering and aluminum design as well as in bridge repair and construction. He's currently pursuing a master's degree at the University of Waterloo in Canada um, and will be presenting the bulk of this presentation. So first, briefly about ClearCalcs. Uh, this is going to be the only slides uh, specifically about our, our organization, but we're providing you this webinar for free. So. Um, we think we have a superior design platform because we are entirely finite element analysis based. Every calculation you do is done precisely for any arbitrary um, support or loading condition. We um, are cloud-based, so you never have to fight for licenses with anybody else. Um, and we are available anywhere, so you can make use of our platform from your laptop, from your tablet or from your uh, mobile phone. So if you would like to make use of us on site, you are free to do so and we encourage that. So you can even build a whole project from your phone if you feel like dealing with typing in on a phone screen. So now I'll pass it to Laurent who will uh, go through the meat of this presentation. Okay, well, thanks Brooks. Uh, yeah, I'll move the computer here, just get a bit more room here, but uh, so, just to tell you a bit about what we're going to be going through today. Um, the, the basic idea here is that at the end of this, you'll be able to design basically a basic wood beam for the design specification. Uh, I'll teach you about some of the different product types that we have when we're designing them with wood. So lumber, glue lamb, and the structural composite lumber, which I'll explain what it is later. Uh, there's a lot of adjustment factors when you're designing with wood. So we're going to go over those and how it works. And then we'll actually go through the design process that we use for a beam. Um, don't worry, if you can make it earlier, we're going to distribute the slide deck and this is all being recorded, so you'll be able to follow the, the, the video later on as well. And just some housekeeping here, if you want to have any questions or anything, if you can use the Q&A question in the Zoom, that makes things a lot easier for us because we see it and we can see how it all works out. So just do that please if you can. Okay, so Next, we're going to talk about the wood products that we, uh, we mentioned. So wood in general, to start with, I mean, you've all seen, I'm sure you've been in a forest before, or if you've seen a tree, so that's, that's wood, right? So in terms of engineering, though, it's got some features that make it very appealing for engineers, and that's why it's, it's used a lot, especially in North America. So the biggest thing is it's high strength to weight ratio. Wood is really light. So on a construction site, somebody can walk with a plank of wood and it's no problem. You can't really do that with a big steel beam or something. So that's a big advantage already there. Um, the biggest drawback with wood is probably its ductility. It's basically got no ductility. And the way we deal with that in wood is 
we use steel or metal connections, and we use a lot of redundancy to allow for some ductility so not everything is a brittle failure mode. Um, a big perk that's becoming more and more relevant these days is it's sustainable and very environmentally friendly. Uh, forests are renewable, especially if they're managed properly. Um, wood itself is a carbon sink, so it's, it's taking carbon away from the atmosphere. It's got a lot of benefits and it's really good for, uh, say, a LEED certification or something like that. And we're getting bigger and bit bigger buildings that are using it. Uh, recently, there was the UBC Commons in uh, Vancouver, which is a university residence that was completed. Uh, that's 18 stories high. So we're actually talking about real buildings here that are entirely made out of wood and more and more being planned out. Uh, people like using wood as a construction material. So it's, it's more and more useful uh, to know it as an engineer. So I'm gonna talk about three main types of wood products today. So sawn lumber, which is the standard two by four that you've always seen. Um, glue lamb, which is a bit more complicated or it's basically a bunch of boards glued together. And then structural composite lumber, which is another type of what we call engineered wood material. There's also other products. So for instance, there's uh, eye joists, which are used in homes or other situations where you want a longer span applications. There's prefabricated trusses, which are often used in, in roofs. Uh, Structural panels, so plywood or oriented strand board, which are used for a lot for shear walls or, or for flooring. Um, and cross laminated timber, which is just starting to get pretty big in, in North America now, where we use basically regular sawn lumber and we make big panels out of it. So we can use them for wood or floors. They have a lot of strength and they, they look really good. So first one we're gonna talk about is sawn lumber. So that's definitely by far the most common wood product almost every house in the US or North America is made out of this stuff. Uh, it's really, really cheap. It's strong and it works well. It's easy to work with. Um, so in terms of engineering with it, there's different grades we can have. So there's slice structural, number one, number two, stud. There's a couple other grades depending on the species, but that's the general ones. And these are visually graded. So it's someone in uh, the lumber mill who looks at them and looks at things like the amount of knots, how big the knots are, to see what grade the, the wood is. And that's kind of what we use to determine the strength uh, using design. You can also get it that's machine graded. So that's a machine will actually test the capacity of the, the wood or test the stiffness of it, correlate it to the strength. Um, that's got a lot less variability, so you can use higher strength, but it's also a lot more expensive. Um, that's used a lot in trusses, so wood trusses that are used to build roofs or something like that. But again, there's a lot of different species of trees, and so there's a lot of different species you can use when you're designing with sawn lumber. Um, and like I said, it's really cheap, but that comes at the cost of, there's a high variability of properties of strength or stiffness, so you have to use very reduced values when you're using design. And we'll go over that later. Next, we're looking at glue lamp. So that's basically the sawn lumber, so the two by four or whatever we're talking about. We take a lot of these and we, we stack them up on top of each other um, and we make, a bigger beam out of these. And the advantage with this is we can use high grade uh, uh, lumber in areas with high stress. So particularly in tension. So for uh, like a simply supported beam, you would put really high grade uh, lumber at the bottom where there's the highest tensions test. And then you could put the cheaper stuff in the middle where there's basically no bending stress, it's only shear. Uh, there's no limit on size with this. So you can have glue lamp beams that are six to ten feet deep and, and it's, it's possible it's expensive but it's definitely possible and these can be cambered like steel beams or you can even create arches with them which are very attractive and you'll see these a lot in, in big great halls or something like that um, the other thing you can do as i mentioned is you put the stronger wood at the bottom but if you have a cantilever or something like that or a continuous beam where you have negative moment you can use what's called a balanced beam and there you'll have still the cheaper material in the middle, but you can have the strong stuff at both ends. But regularly, you'd only have the strong stuff at the bottom, which is something to be careful on site so that they don't get put upside down. And finally, we have the structural composite lumber. And so these are more of a newer material, um, and they're kind of a way to use even more of the wood that we have in more efficient ways. So a lot of these are basically wood chips that are glued together in a specific orientation. Uh, so the three big ones are laminated veneer lumber, parallel strand lumber, or laminated strand lumber. And they all behave more or less similarly. Uh, they have different properties, but these are all given by the manufacturer. And that's one of the big things is that with sawn lumber and glue lamb, the strengths are standardized, the sizes are standardized, so it's very easy to use the, the standard with them. 
with uh, structural composite lumbers, they're still manufacturer based. So you'll have to contact the manufacturer, look on their website, see what uh, design values that you use in design. Um, and so that's, that's a bit more of a challenge here. But in general, structural composite lumber is, is really strong because it's engineered lumber and we can use the best wood in small quantities to make it really strong. And it's very low variability just because it's, it's wood chips or whatever, so it absorbs the variability in general. So next, we'll talk a bit about how to actually design with wood. So in the United States, the, the governing code is the National Design Specification, or the NDS, and the latest version of it is the 2018 version. So almost every building that's designed out of wood, except for residential houses in the US, uses this code. Um, one of the big things is uh, if you're used to steel or concrete where basically every design now is done with LRFD, uh, wood is very commonly still designed with allowable stress design. And so the NDS reflects that there's values for both uh, allowable stress design and LRFD. So it's something to be conscious about if you're working with uh, another engineer who's designing with wood, um, it's very possible that they're gonna be using allowable stress design. Um, so there's the main standard, the NDS 2018, and there's also what's called the supplement. And the supplement is, that's where you'll find basically all the information about the standard sizes and the actual design strengths that you can use. Uh, there's a lot of different species of wood and there's a lot of different uh, ways to use it. And so the supplement is a separate standard um, that you can use to, to find the strengths for your situation. And one of the other things is that for wood, you also have lateral loads. And so these are not included in the national design standard. Uh, there's a special uh, standard called the special design provisions for wind and seismic. And that will tell you how to design say a shear wall out of wood or a diaphragm or something. And all of these are available for free online. I, I have the link on the slide here. Uh, the commentary is not included, so you have to pay for that, but the standard itself is available. So that's, that's where you can go get that. So next, let's talk a bit about how we design a wood beam. So the first part here is uh, you're gonna find your demand. So usually you'll use ASC 7 or the local building code or the international building code, whichever applies in, in your project. Um, Again, at this point, you have to decide if you're going to be designing with uh, allowable stress design or LRFD. Um, that's usually a project-based decision, so you might not decide that, but it's very important that you use the right load combinations, obviously. Uh, then you're going to use the term in your material and your design conditions, and that's going to vary on a lot of things. So is your project outside, inside, uh, where is it geographically located, what's available, um, what's your contractor best deal uh, with, uh, all these kinds of factors. And again, that's just part of the design process. And when you're actually getting to your beam, there's four limit states that you have to check. So first of all is the flexural capacity, then we have the shear capacity, the bearing capacity, and obviously serviceability or deflections. So we're gonna go through each four of these, but first we're gonna talk about adjustments. So the design philosophy in wood is, um, it's basically the same as with steel or concrete. Your demands have to be less than your capacity. And if you're, in allowable stress design, you're going to be looking at, at it on the stress side. So you're going to calculate your stress from your applied loads and compare it to your allowable stress. And then LRFD usually will deal with loads. So you'll calculate your ultimate shear and then you'll see your ultimate uh, shear strength. Uh, so in all these cases, you see there's a lot of factors. And this is where timber uh, or wood design really differs from the other standards is you have a lot of factors to consider when you're designing with it. And this is where um, it, it becomes a little different than the other ones. So we're gonna go through all these different factors. Um, and these are all specified either in the NDS 2018 or the supplement when they vary by species, which happens very often. So let's get started on the, the factors here. So the first one that's very different than any other material really is the load duration factor. So wood in general, it's very sensitive to how long or the speed of the loading. Um, when you're loading things fast, it gets a lot stronger. Um, and it's seen in metals as well, but it, it's a lot smaller of an effect, so we don't usually consider it in design. But in wood, it's, it's a big effect. So if you see at the bottom there, these tables are from the NDS 2018. Because if you have an impact load, you get twice as much strength as if you were dealing with a regular life load. So it's, it plays a big impact in the design, and you can save a lot of wood uh, using that. Um, now, one of the big things with this factor, though, is that it only affects the bending strength, the shear strength, and the compressive strength. And 
it doesn't affect the stiffness of your beam. Um, and so when you're dealing later on with lateral torsional buckling or stability issues in general, uh, you have to consider the fact that it's not um, accounted in the stability. And so you'll see it gets a little tricky about how we deal with that, but we're going to talk about that later. That's one thing to remember. Next, we have the, basically the environmental factors. So wood, uh, unlike steel or concrete, the, its strength varies a lot based on moisture content. And so in general, if you have a moisture content above 19%, you're going to say that your beam is in uh, wet condition. And then that takes away a lot of strength. Uh, if we're talking about bearing, for instance, you lose half your strength in bearing. For bending, I think it's 25%. And again, it depends on the species and uh, the type of product you're using, but in general, it, it can really reduce your strength. So if you're going to be, for instance, outside or uh, in, a, I don't know, in a, in a pool environment, you'd have to be considering your wet service factor. Um, one thing to, to remember is that the structural composite lumbers usually are not used in wet conditions, that's just because the, the glue and the, the process that they use doesn't really lend itself well to those conditions. And the other one is the temperature factor. So at high temperatures, wood doesn't perform as well, especially if it's wet. So you can see on the table behind under this, um, you can lose an extra 50% on strength if you're you know, above 125 degrees. So that's another thing to consider in your environmental conditions. Next, we have kind of our section factors. So these have to do with the size effect in uh, wood. So basically research has shown, and it's, I guess it, it comes from statistics that uh, the bigger your, your wood size is, or your section size is, the more chances are that there's a defect in it. And since wood is a very brittle material, uh, that basically ends up lowering your overall strength that you'd observe in practice. And so we have to account for that. Uh, so the first one we look at is for dimensioned uh, timbers. So that's, has to do with the small, say a two by four, or two by eight, or two by 12. These ones are very susceptible to the size effect. And so the size factor we apply to it. And since the design values aren't based on the smallest one, you can actually get a big increase in strength from it. Sometimes at very big sizes, you can also get a decrease in strength. So you have to apply it. And that's basically, that'll tell you the actual strength of your member uh, for the size it has. For glue lamb and SCL members, it's basically the same principle, but uh, in these cases, because they're engineered products and we're looking at the whole beam as a whole, we use what's called a volume factor. So not only is the, the cross-section size of so the, the width times the depth, we also consider the length of the product as the, into like the, the, the amounts of defects that could be in there. So it's another thing to consider. And finally, we also have the flat use factor. So the design values are used, uh, they're always assuming basically that you're gonna have a, a vertical member. So if your two by 12 is gonna be uh, deep, but if you're using it flat, um, again, statistically, there's less chances of having defects or you have more area for it to, to resist. So you can actually get an increase in strength. For large members though, it, it switches to a decrease in strength. So you have to be careful about that. Now there's also factors for LRFD design. So the standard, the NDS standard is still mostly based on ASD design. And the way they deal with LRFD is to give you a couple extra factors to bring it to LRFD levels. So, the first one is the format conversion factor. So that basically takes away the safety factor that's included in the ASD design values. So you can see they're pretty big values. For sure, it goes almost up to three times the design strength. So you definitely want to use that one. Um, and then we also have a resistance factor, which is basically like steel or concrete, where we reduce our strength based on statistics. Now there's also other factors. So there's the repetitive member factor. So that's for instance, if you had a, a floor supported by joists uh, where you have many joists right next to each other, you're allowed a 15% increase in strength. And the reason for that is basically if, if one of your members happens to be a little weaker and fails, there's probably 20 other ones that can help support the load. And so you're rewarded for having higher redundancy. But that's usually only used basically in floors, uh, the regular residential floor, where you have a lot of joists next to each other. You wouldn't use this for a glue lamp. And there's very specific provisions about what you can use in the NDS. There's also the incising factor. So there's some species where, um, well, most species of wood, you can treat them. So either against moisture, fire, or uh, insects, like termites. Um, you can treat them to help them resist those attacks better. Uh, but 
some woods, the, the, the treatment, the, the chemical that they put in, it doesn't really penetrate into the woods. So what they'll do is they'll poke it with the machine that injects it into the wood, but that makes our wood weaker. So we have to account for that if it's incised. Um, usually you'll know by the species you use, but that's a pretty specific case. There's also the buckling stiffness factor, which we're not going to talk about. That's really only used in woods, uh, woods trusses, and we're not, we're not going to discuss this today. Um, and there's also for glue lamb, when you're dealing with curved or tapered or arches, there's also other factors to consider. But again, we're not going to deal with these today. That's a pretty uh, involved com uh, system. So we'll deal with that perhaps in a different webinar. So first of all, we're going to talk about bending. So this is, again, based on the the bending equation, the regular MY over I that you, you learned in your mechanics courses, um, it's very similar. It's not like steel where we used a plastic section modulus because you need ductility for that and wood doesn't have it. So we're only using the, the extreme fiber stress uh, for failure. Um, and then the big thing is we have to consider lateral torsional buckling or stability in general, um, like steel, wood can, can sway to one side and, and break. So that's something that we need to look at. Uh, so you can see the formulas here. Um, they're very similar for allowable stress design and LRFD. And you can see uh, there's a lot of factors in between after. So this is our bending strength and this is all factors that we apply to it. Um, and I highlighted the CL value because that's the stability factor for lateral torsional buckling. It looks intimidating, there's a lot of them, but usually they're almost always taken to one in practice. So it looks scary, but they'll almost always end up being just a bunch of ones. So you don't have to worry too much about it. So lateral stability, that's probably the biggest thing with bending members. Uh, that's for lateral torsional buckling. You have an image there of a beam that's, that's a steel beam, but wood is the same, which it's, it's bent to one side like this. Um, so in the code, we use the effective length method. And that's a very simple method. Basically, you give it your unbraced length in typical loading conditions. So you have a you know, distributed load or a point load in the middle or something. And it'll tell you, okay, you use this effective length, you calculate your, uh, your buckling load, and basically you're done. And that, that works really well for standard conditions. But if you have a continuous beam or a cantilever or anything that's not a standard loading condition. So if you have a combination of point loads and distributed loads, it doesn't work. And so the alternative solution is published by the American Wood Council. We also make the, the NDS. Um, and that's basically you're using the same calculations as you'd use in the steel code. So you calculate your CB factor for lateral torsional buckling and you do your calculations with that. And at the end you get a similar factor, but it's, a, it's just a different procedure to use. That's what we use at ClearCalx, and most other software that calculates wood beams also uses that. And the reason for it is just the, the regular provisions, if you use the ones in the code, are really, really conservative for non-standard conditions. And these ones are very versatile. Though. It's called the TR14 provisions. They're really versatile, and they work well. So that's what we, we use. But for this design sample, if you're doing it by hand, you'll probably be using the effective length method. So the way that we do this, I'll, I'll just go over it. So first of all, you'll get your effective length. So you can see the table at the bottom here. That'll tell you if you have, say, a single span beam with the UDL, you basically, your unbraced length is almost double or a bit more than double what your length between braces is. And then it, tell, it tells you that. And then you use this equation, your slenderness ratio, you can calculate it. It's just based on your uh, section provisions. Um, the nice thing is because we have basically always rectangular sections, all the equations simplify a lot. You don't have to worry about moments of inertia or warping coefficients. It's all included in there already. Um, so then once you have your slenderness ratio, you can find your elastic buckling stress. And you'll notice the, there's E min prime, and that's your Young's modulus, but that also has to be adjusted. So that has to do again, if it's wet, your wood's going to be a little less stiff. Um, if it's high temperature, if it's incised, you lose some stiffness. So you have to account for that as well when you're finding your, your buckling stress. So once you find that, you find what we call the nominal section strength. So in that case, you use all the other factors. You find your section strength, except for the stability factor. And if you're using glue lamp, you also don't account for the, the volume factor, which I'll explain why in, in a couple slides here. 
And once you find that F star B, there's just this big equation, you plug all your numbers in, and that will give you your lateral torsional or your stability factor that you put in, and then you can find your, your factored strength for your, or adjusted strength for your B. So the volume factor, I was mentioning, you don't use it with glue lamb in combination with uh, lateral stability. And the reason for this is that lateral stability in beams is due to compression. And so that's basically, we have compression at the top, it's making the beam sway to one side or the other. Whereas the volume effect accounts for the size effect. So as I mentioned, you know, you might have defects in it. And the size effect really only takes place when you're dealing with tension. And so our volume factor will only look at it in the tension part, whereas the lateral stability factor will only use that the compression part. In practice, what this means is you calculate both and you take the lower of whichever it is. And then the other thing I'm, I'm touched on it briefly before is the duration factor. So it's tempting, you have this uh, CD factor, this, dura this duration factor, um, which varies basically based on your load case. And it's tempting to just find your factored loads and then divide them by this duration factor, see which load case governs. And for shear, or if you have a fully supported uh, uh, brace beam, you can get away with it. But if you're dealing with anything that has to do with buckling, either in compression or with lateral torsional buckling, you can't do that. Um, you probably get away with it if you're dealing with live and dead load just because the factors are very similar. But as soon as you have uh, wind and seismic, it can be very, very counterintuitive which uh, load case governs. Uh, there's just such a big difference in these duration factors. And the thing is, when you have a really slender beam, these factors might not have as much of an effect as you think they do. And so in those cases, the safest way to do it is to just basically do the calculation twice with both uh, load cases. But that's something to consider. With experience, obviously, you get better at it. But um, like I said, with wind and seismic, you do want to be very careful because it, it, can, it can surprise you a lot which load case is going to cover. Next, we're going to talk about shear. So we did bending. The next big thing, obviously, is shear. So that's at the support. Um, and the big thing here is wood in general is much, much weaker in shear. So whereas maybe you'd have a 2000 PSI strength for your uh, bending strength, in shear you might only get 200. So it's much, much lower. But the nice news is since we're dealing with rectangles, we have a lot of area to take that shear. Um, so that's, that's very convenient. Uh, one of the things is like concrete, um, you can take your shear at a distance D or the depth of your beam from the supports. But the trick with that though, um, is most people don't use it just because shear doesn't govern that often. And even if it does govern, a lot of engineers prefer to, to stay away from shear failures. So they'll, they'll they prefer to use the, the full load. Um, another big thing is when you're dealing say with uh, steel design, you can just use your average stress in the web and you call it good to, to find your, your shear resistance. You can't do that in wood. Uh, again, that has to do uh, with the fact that there's basically no ductility in wood. So as soon as the middle breaks, um, or the, the first fibers, there's no yielding to redistribute those stresses. So again, we have to look at the peak stress. And if you remember from your mechanics courses, you can calculate your shear stress using this VQ over IAD formula, um, which for a rectangle very conveniently reduces down to just a 50% increase in the average stress. So you can see the formulas at the bottom. Again, we have a lot of factors. And the big thing to see here is that uh, the applied stress from shear, you increase it by 50%. And then in the LRFD, your resistance, you cut it down by two thirds. And like I said, the reason for that is just to account for the peak stress. Um, you can see there's a bunch of factors here again, which we went over. Um, so these ones, again, a bunch of them will usually go to unity and disappear, but you have to consider that in your design. Next, in bearing, uh, this is one that actually governs quite a bit in wood. Um, in connections, usually, it's very common that you'll see, say, a beam bearing on a post like I have on the, on the picture here. Uh, and the bearing strength in wood is really low. So what we mean by bearing, the reason it's low is that instead of pushing parallel to the fibers of the wood, which is basically what a tree would see so that it's really strong, you're pushing uh, perpendicular to the fibers, you're squishing the, say, the trunk of the tree together, and it's really not that strong that way. Um, another big thing about this is that there's no duration factor here, 
Uh, it doesn't really matter how fast you load it or anything, um, but it's something to, to remember. And you're allowed to increase the strength a little bit when you have a bearing factor, but not at the end of a beam. So if you have a simply supported beam, you usually wouldn't uh, use this factor. But in interior supports, if you have a point load, it, it can actually increase your strength quite a bit, so it might be worth using. And so you see here um, the basic formula again. You have your, uh, we call it FC perpendicular. So we're acknowledging that it's compression, but it's perpendicular to the grain. So it's a different design value than uh, if you had just a column in compression. And we have different factors. And as you can see, there's no uh, CD factor here. So we have to, to remember that. And actually, I just see here that there's a lambda factor, but that shouldn't be there. So you should keep that in mind. And finally, we have deflection. Um, the biggest thing here is, like, uh, like concrete actually, wood creep. So creep is a big factor that you have to consider when you're uh, designed for serviceability in, uh, in wood. Um, so the way we do with that is we kind of separate our load cases in short term and long term. So short term would be live load, snow load, or wind load. And you want to make sure, say, it's usually for floor, it'd be L over 360. You want to make sure that it, uh, you know, your deflection is less than that. For the long term, uh, what we usually do is we'll have, we'll calculate the instantaneous deflection. So regular calculation of deflection of the dead load and the live load. But then what we'll do is we'll take the dead load and uh, the NDS gives you a factor. So usually if you have dry condition, you'll use 50% of the dead load, the, the dead load deflection for your condition. And so what this does is it basically estimates the total deflection that you'll get after your beams in service. So the reason we want to do this is that um, the instantaneous dead load deflection is usually not that important because the finishes and all that will be put on after the dead load deflection anyways. Uh, but after the, say the, the plaster on the walls is put on and everything, then our, that's when the plaster could start cracking if it creeps too much. So that's what we want to limit. Um, and again, the stiffness of the Young's modulus that you use Again, that's also adjusted. So if you're in uh, wet conditions at high temperature or using in flat use, you have to account for that. So you put those factors on your uh, elastic modulus to account for, for lower stiffness. Um, so again, once you're dealing with deflection, short term is the same as with steel, but long term is like comfort creep. And uh, I have to do that. Okay, so next we'll do some beam calculation examples. So I'm gonna get out of here. Uh, first, I'll show you the example. So the first one we'll do is, a, is a real, it'll just be a joist like you probably have in your house or something, just uh, a standard two by joist, a, a board of wood, um, and it's spaced at 16 inches. So that's typically what you have in a house. Uh, in this case, it's fully supported laterally. So we don't have to worry about uh, lateral torsional buckling, which is nice. And it's bearing on the two by four top plate at the end. So that's something that's important to account for when we're looking at uh, a bearing. Um, so it's asking us in this case to find the smallest adequate number one Southern pine two by section. So what we mean by a two by is you know, two by four, two by eight, two by 10. We want to find a section. So I'm going to go into clear calcs and show you kind of how we do it here. So if I go here, I'll just create a new project. So uh, clear calc, and we'll add a new calculation. So you can see we've got quite a few different beams or columns or whatever, and we're, we're always adding more. So keep on the lookout for what's gonna come up. So I'm gonna add a wood beam using ASD. And it's just loading up now. Okay, so you can see here we have our references and our assumptions. Um, so let's go back here to our example. So total length is 10 feet, it's fully braced. Let's go back and put this in. So total length, we'll put this as 10 feet and we'll set it as fully braced. Next, we're gonna look at our supports. So we have pin supports at zero and 10 feet. You can see we just have a formula here to, 
to automatically update it. And our bearing length is 3.5 inches, which is what it would be for a, a two by four top plate. So we don't have to change that. Uh, then we go look here. We have to change the tributary width. So we set these uh, joists were at a 16 inch spacing. So I'll just enter 16 divided by 12. So 1.33 feet spacing. Okay, and our dead load and live load were 25 PSF and 50 PSF. So we're good there. Now, in this case, what are we using right now? We're using a five and a half by 16. This is a glue land beam. So we want a two by. So let's go, we have this little member selector here. So we click on that. And so we want our type to be dimension lumber. Species, we said Southern pine. So let's enter that. And our grade was number one. So number one. And since we want a two by, we'll set our max width to two inches. So now we can look at all the sizes and it'll tell us what's governing. So if we look at a two by three, which is really small for a beam or a joist, you can see it's, it's way overused. So we go down, we see a two by eight satisfies everything. Bending governs. And you can see our shear is, is very low. So there's no problem here. So we, Select it, and it'll recalculate everything here. And now we found, so we have our applied bending stress in this case, 1170 PSI, and our allowable stress is 1250 PSI. So we're good. It'll do the same with shear, bearing, and it'll also calculate our short-term deflection, which is 0.2 inches, and our long-term long deflection. So that accounts for creep as well, and that's a quarter inch. Uh, so we can go down here and now we see this repeating member. In this case, we didn't apply it yet, but we could apply the repeating member factor. So let's apply it. Since we have a bunch of joists repeating next to each other, we'll put it on. And now we can see our capacity is down to 82%. In this case, we'll keep it like this, but you can go back and see if now there's a different beam that works better. That's, that's definitely something you can do. Um, so if we look, say, at the elastic modulus, you can see all the factors here. So wet service factor, temperature factor, they're all one. So like I was saying, they usually all end up being one. And if you look here at adjusted modulus of elasticity, we have our modulus of elasticity times all the uh, factors and they're all one, so it just stays the same. Um, if we look at our bending design, same thing, but now you can see we have a 1.15 for our repeating member factor. So we'll, that's good, that, that increases our strength. It was 1,250 and now it's 1,440. Uh, if you look at bearing, we have a table with all our supports. So we can see that all our supports, in this case, they're the same. They're 97.9 PSI, allowable is 565. So we're happy. And we can look at deflections. Again, similar thing. So we're finding L over 480 and L over 610. So we're, we're plenty within the code limits. So that's basically, we've got a full beam design now. It, it worked perfectly. Um, you can see our shear diagram, our moment diagram, and then if we want, we could go and change the, the different load cases to see what else it is, and you can see your free body diagram. You can see there's self-weight included, so we're calculating that. In wood, it's pretty common for people, especially with small two buys or something, people will often ignore the self-weight and just keep it in their dead load and PSF. So if you want to do that, if that's easy, we can just make it no for include self-weight, and then it's it's gone, which in this case, it doesn't really change anything. So that was our first example. We're going to go to the second one, which is going to be a little more complex. So here, I'll just show you real quick. So in this case, we've got this cantilevered beam supporting a gym floor. It's a fancy gym, I guess. Um, and so it's got a high live load, low dead load, just because in general, in wood structures, we can get a much lower dead load than in uh, other structures. Uh, so our beam spacing is at six feet and it's bearing on eight by eight posts. So that an eight by eight, the, I, I forgot to mention this earlier, but um, in general, our sound number dimensions are gonna be a lot smaller than what they actually, the nominal size is. So in this case, it's a seven and a quarter inch. Um, and this time we're designing it, it's an LRFT project. So we're designing it for LRFT provisions. So let's go back to clear calcs and we'll add a new calculation. And we're going to do wood beam this time, LRFD. 
just going to load it up. So this is all cloud-based. So the nice thing is if I make a, a mistake or my computer crashed right now, I can just pull it back up and it'll all be saved. Or I can open it on Brooke's computer here or something and it works fine. Um, so in this case, oh, I'll go back to it. What we're trying to do here is we're trying to find the 24F V8DF glue lamp section. So 24F V8 refers to the grade and the species. So 24F means 2,400 uh, PSI bending strength. And then the V8 just refers to how the, the different uh, boards of wood are set up. So V8 is actually what we call a balanced section. So we have strong uh, wood at the top and the bottom which is what you typically use in a continuous beam, just because you have a negative moment as well. So we'll go back to clear calcs. So our total length is 43 feet. So we'll change this. And this time our lateral torsional buckling bracing was only at the support. So we'll leave it like this. Uh, our deflection limits, we'll leave them like this. And now we have to add our supports. So this one, our we have three supports. So the first one was at 15 feet. So we'll change it. And we'll add another one at 35 feet. So they're here. And our bearing lengths, I said, were seven and a quarter inches. So let's change this here. Whoops. And now we're getting an error because we have to put these all in. Okay. And surface condition and temperature range are all dry and there's low temperature, so no problem. So you can see here on our free body diagram, we've got our three supports already. Um, now, our tributary width, we said was six feet. So let's change it to six feet. Our dead load is, was 25 PSF, but our live load was 100. So let's change that. Now we could also add a point load if we wanted to, or we can also add different snow uh, loads. So we could add a snow load, wind load, whatever we want. Uh, so that's, in this case, we don't have any, but that's something we could add a moment load as well. Um, so that can be done. So now we can see we've got our occupancy floor self weight and note that we're showing the factored loads. So in this case, we're showing the 1.2D plus 1.6L uh, load case. So you can see the factored, we can see the factored reactions as well. Um, so with that done, let's find our glue lamp beam. So what were we looking for here? We were looking for a 24 FV8 glue lamp section and a width of five and a half inches. So let's go back to clear calcs and we'll click on our member selection. And so our grade we said was 24 FV8 Douglas fir. And our max width was five and a half inches. So we'll put 5.5. Oh, whoops. My dot key doesn't work for some reason. Okay, well that, that's fine. We'll just leave it like this and we'll just scroll a bit more. But, so we'll scroll down to the five and a half. And now, let's see here. So what we find is the 11 and a quarter inches deep beam is the one that works the best. So it satisfies every condition. Now, if we go up again, actually, and we say, look at the, two and a half inch wide beams, you can see in this case, they're actually failing and bearing. Even if they're deep enough, they're still failing and bearing. So in this case, they're best governing. So that's obviously inadequate, but that's something to look at um, when you're dealing with this stuff. Just because it's okay in bending and shear, it doesn't mean it's okay in, in bearing because it does govern rather often. So we'll go back to here. And which one was it? Uh, oh, whoops, this is five and one eight. So five and a half by, 11 and a quarter. So that's what we're going to use. So we'll select it. And now you can see it's just updating. So our ultimate bending moment in positive bending was 254 and in negative bending was minus 444. So we're getting all this from our internal FEA engine, same as these uh, plots here. Now notice in this case, negative bending and positive bending, we basically have the same capacity. So if we go down to uh, bending design, and we'll put it in detailed mode just so we can see better what's going on. Um, we'll go back down here. So you can see our 
stability factors are, based, are a little different. So that's why we're getting slightly different strengths in positive and negative bending. So you can see here, uh, it's calculating and multiply it. And you can see we're taking the minimum of the volume factor, which in this case is just one, or uh, the, the stability factor. So that's what we want to make sure that we're, we're doing. Now, if for instance, um, we went back here and we used a 24FV4 DF, that's an unbalanced combination. So in this case, if we look at, we had five and a half by 14 inches or by 11 and a quarter, you'll see that oh, it doesn't pass the moment check anymore. And so if we stick with the same one, just this is the same beam except slightly different uh, beam grade, you can see negative bending, it's actually less strong, right? So it's 368 uh, kip inches instead of 475 like it used to be. So that's where, that's where for a continuous beam where as you can see the peak moment is negative, you're gonna wanna use a, a balanced layout. So that's something to, to keep in mind as well. Um, so I think that concludes this example. Um, basically, you always want to check your factors and those are really easy to deal with. You just have to be very conscious of your conditions. So environmental conditions, size, um, your loading conditions, things like that. So you just want to be very careful about that. Um, and so in a software like ClearCalc, you know, it's usually you just tell it what your conditions are and, and no problem. So we'll go back to our presentation now. Um, so now we're done with the examples. We're going to go, I'm just going to basically conclude this. Um, so to sum it up, um, wood, I hope I kind of made the case to it for you. It's a very efficient uh, product. It's cheap, it's strong for its weight, it's easy to work with, and it's got a lot of uses. It's sustainable, which is good for, especially nowadays, it's getting better and better and more uh, demanded by building owners. And uh, it's becoming more and more used in commercial buildings. Um, there's a lot of different products you can use from the regular saw number where it basically comes straight off the tree, to structural composite lumber where you're really dealing with wood chips that are put in a factory and it's a complex process at a higher cost, but at much better strength and uh, other properties. So when you actually design a beam, you have four different uh, checks to make in bending, shear, bearing, and your deflections or visibility. Uh, and they all have you know, their little quirks to them. Um, especially bearing, you'll find is often the governing thing and it's often overlooked. Obviously, that depends on your connections, but that's something you want to look at. And the biggest thing, again, with wood is you have to adjust your strengths. Um, you might be surprised, especially with the duration factor, you really have to look at it. It can play a big part in your design, and you don't want to end up with an uh, unconservative design because you forgot that your beam's outside and it's going to be getting rained on or something. So that's really something to look at and to, to not forget with, uh, with uh, this. So here's some other resources for wood design. So the American Wood Council publishes a lot of help and they're very helpful if you have any questions for wood design. So there's we call the uh, Manual for Engineered Wood Constructions. So and I'll tell you all about Glulam, SCL, or other uh, 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 things. And it'll also work for Sun Lumber, actually. Um, so that's very useful, especially for connections. They have a lot of examples in there. And they also have structural wood design examples. So if you're not sure and you're doing a design, you want to make sure you're doing it the right way. You can go through the structural wood design examples and well there are solved examples that you can use to practice and there's two big textbooks that i've found very useful in the past there's the aitc which is the american institute for timber construction they have the timber construction manual and they even though they're called the timber the institute for timber construction they focus a lot on, on uh, engineered lumber so blue lamb scl so their examples are a little biased towards that but it's still a very very helpful resource and there's also what's called Design of Wood Structures, ASDLRFD. And that one was actually just updated for the 2018 standards. So that's probably the best resource right now if you're looking for a textbook on, on wood design. So with that, I'd um, like to, to open up if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer them or, or, or Brooks here as well. Um, if not, well, thank you for, for listening. I uh, really appreciate it. And uh, we hopefully you enjoyed this and we'll, See you again. I encourage you to check out ClearCalc as well. Hopefully, you find it useful.